What's going on, everybody? Thank you all so much for tuning into this special live stream interview on Mikasa Sukasa. And today I have a very, very special guest, the running back for the LA Chargers, Justin Jackson. On Justin, how you doing? I'm doing well. Yo, appreciate you having me. Oh man, no problem. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, let the people know a little bit about the school. Famous oh. sport West. Um, so I'm pretty sure people will be interested in it. Sorry, you you kind of went in and out right there. Can you repeat that? I was saying let let the let the people uh, know what you do and um, you know which where you went to college and because I heard okay. it's a pretty interesting sport here in the U.S. I'm sure they would want to know about. <laughs> yeah, um, so I went to college at Northwestern University. It's uh, right outside of Chicago. Uh, I played football there, and then last year I got drafted to the LA Chargers. Um, so you know NFL American football. So yeah, it's uh it's been a wild ride so far, but um having a good time with it we're actually starting up pretty soon here our camp starts next wednesday so yeah Ooh, getting excited man, about yeah. That. yeah yeah you had, a, you had a pretty good season too man for a rookie right you had a couple of touchdowns well you have about, about what 50 carries a few hundred yards yeah um, roughly it was, it was uh it was definitely an up and down year uh for me personally for us as a team we did really well um you yeah know, start, start of the year uh practice squad and everything worked my way up and then got uh got in that's the way to do it part. Yeah, exactly. One of our primetime games against Pittsburgh, and then the next week I ended up starting against the Chiefs, and those were two of our bigger wins of the year. So it was it was nice That's to contribute and, uh, and and get in there, you know. And you got a you got a pretty good chance to actually like y'all about to trade somebody, right? And so you got a good chance to be that that one two punch. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, it's. It's the it's the business of the NFL, so you can't really. Get well, I hate that too. Politics go out there, everywhere, but... right? Exactly. Politics <laughs> everywhere. So, well, that's good stuff, man. So, uh, something that distinguishes you from your contemporaries that I've seen. Um, I have a few friends in the NFL myself, mm -hmm. and you know, they generally, you know, the ones who pay attention to politics, they generally generally watch politics and politics on a very different level. Do you seem to have an understanding? Uh, that's much deeper than most of the people in the NFL. It goes beyond just mm. raw activism for general causes. I've seen yeah. you uh, retweeting people like Jimmy Dore, uh, mm -hmm. myself, uh, a lot of independent thinkers. Um, yeah. And you seem to be pretty bold uh, with with where you stand in your politics. How did you yeah. come to to you know with? Because I understand that the college schedule for for. And if NCAA players are basically slaves, so uh, you know it's pretty demanding. It's pretty demanding. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. pretty much free of charge. And then mm -hmm. at the NFL, you know, you're getting you're not at you know work here 17, 17 weeks out of the year. So mm -hmm. where do you find time to get involved in politics, uh, or at least learn about it and promote it at this level? Uh, yeah. So in college. Pretty much during the 2016 election, election cycle is really when I started getting involved much more because, you know, in the locker room and, you know, you know, when I live when I'm living with my teammates and stuff, we get into those debates, you know, and I felt like I wasn't really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. At least at Northwestern. <laughs> sure. You have more political locker rooms than NCAA. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 100 percent. We definitely get in those debates. And and on it, like looking back at it, a lot of us weren't really that knowledgeable. Um, I think that goes to the tribalistic nature really of, of our politics you kind of just were on the side of where your parents were um and i and i thought 70 percent of the country yeah yeah and i thought that led to discussions that weren't were very superficial and weren't really um you know steeped in any type of historical knowledge really of politics and, and of these issues so i really wanted to make sure after you know having come to that realization that i wanted to get more into politics and really learn more so when i went into the debates you know against not only my teammates just in you know in, in life um that i could be knowledgeable on, on the issue and i think if you come into it with knowledge then you could um it's it's less of just you know throwing insults at each other and more of actually having a constructive <laughs> conversation so it wasn't enough for you to be the best player on the field you had to beat them in politics <laughs> too okay got it. so you're competitive that's how you got it. <laughs> good stuff so um now that's in as, as educated you can be on some of the history. We we both know because I've seen you know some of your tweets that there are two types of history when it comes to politics. There's oh, yeah. revisionist oh, history mm -hmm. and then there's actual history. So what helped you discern between uh, to help you get to where you're at to where you are today? Um, I think well, you know, obviously mainstream media and, and what you watch on TV, they tell you one side of the story 
and it's very clouded and you know i think special interests and you know i don't know it's just for me personally i wanted to look past that because i felt like they weren't really talking about any of the issues on a on a level that was past surface level type stuff so i, I went looking on the internet and on youtube for places mm. that would actually inform me on why certain things are the way they are why certain people vote the way they do um and why certain candidates are better than others and so mm. that's kind of when i when i found uh the young turks tyt um shows like that shows like secular talk uh with kalkinski and and really a branch off tyt uh, and aggressive progressives with uh jimmy Dore. so that's kind of when i finally had my political awakening like wow like this, a, lot, a lot of stuff they were talking about <laughs> stuff i had just never heard of never knew um and i was like wow and it, it and it what really spoke to me was that it wasn't just the republican party like i had always heard it was the republican party and the democratic party um that were yeah doing these things to regular working people because that's you know that's what my family was just a working class middle class family and a lot of my relatives were very, the working poor so um yeah, I think it's very easy to fall into that trap and just be like, well, it's just the Republicans. Um, they've been doing this to us. But you got to realize that for eight years, we had Obama. For eight years, we had Clinton. Um, and those weren't great years for the working poor either. So mm -hmm. that's 100 percent true. Yeah. Now, Jim, probably you did you do three or four years or four years, four years. So yeah, you, you had a pretty decent idea that you were going to get drafted, right? Mm. So. Even knowing that, okay, I'm going to actually be better off probably, you know, yeah. I understand like the average lifespan of an NFL career is like three years or something like that. But yeah. you had a pretty good idea um, that you were going to be successful. And a lot yeah. of people, when they reach that type of success, they oftentimes are like, you know, they just kind of forget about the struggles of the people around yeah. them. They Definitely. kind of become absorbed and, and not necessarily they don't care, but they just don't they don't go out of their way yeah. to learn more and then educate yeah. people in their circle. So yeah. what do you feel like separates you there? What made you say, okay, I know I'm going to, I'm going to be successful, but I still I need to do my part to become educated so I can educate others. Um, I'm just that type of person. Like, I, you know, even though, you know, I play in the NFL or whatever, we earn a certain you know, amount of money. Um, I've always felt like I was just another guy, you know, even when I was, you know, popular in college, I was a good player or whatever. I always felt like I was just just another normal guy, you know. I'm an American citizen as well, and um, and it's actually interesting because uh, I was looking at a Cardi B tweet the other day, and she was talking about how she didn't mind. She already pays a lot in taxes, but she wants to know where her tax money is going, and that's why I always don't we say, all say like I, I don't mind paying my fair share in taxes because I want to be helping other people. But right now my taxes aren't going helping people. They're going to mm -hmm. military industrial contracts, uh, contractors, you know, they're going to defense contractors. Um, they're going to tax cuts. They're going to all these things that aren't helping regular people. Um, and yeah, so 100%. if I'm going to pay taxes anyway, then I want my tax money going to good progressive causes that are going to actually help people. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially people that are very rich, they just, you know, they gift to charity or whatever. And they're like, Oh, I did my due. Um, but yes, yeah. that's, that's really not enough because that charity money, you don't, well, first off, you don't even know who's behind those charities, where that money's going directly, all the type of stuff. So that's why you need a government institution really parsing, parsing that out who we can hold accountable. Um, and yeah. that's not, and there's not things that are done in the dark that we can't see. 100% agree, man. And it's funny because always people, somebody said, so, you know, obviously the current thing was always a big thing and I said man that's like the least of my concerns with Trump and they're like why I'm like I mean have you seen anything that your taxes go towards 93 percent right. of schools are funded by property taxes right. uh I lived in New York for a while I live in LA y'all have tolls too and and I paid 16 dollars to go into the city 16 dollars to leave the city right uh, but I yeah. still had to pay a road tax okay right. uh if you don't if you live in Queens or Long Island and you don't take the the MTA the metro you still have to pay an MTA payroll tax, mm -hmm. but then you still have to pay use the Metro. Right. Um, like, you know, say that your taxes are going to, to, to universal health care, to Obamacare, and then you have to pay a deductible pay, right, and right. Then you ha yeah. like they raise taxes to implement Obamacare, and then we still have to pay more. So right. it, it doesn't make any, when you really think about it, and Mike Gravel actually made a great point, he said that, income taxes are wrong and because he was sitting on the finance committee once upon mm -hmm. a time he said we should be taxing uh off of the sales right off of how much right. and not how much you uh, make 
which I actually am 100% in agreement with. I think mm. the income tax is a way for, for the corporations to slide um, and right. for rich people to slide. If you yeah. tax what they spend, it's a whole different thing. It goes directly exactly. back to that economy. So exactly. um, let's talk about the candidates, man. What candidates, what's, what's the opinion of the 2020 field and the Democrats this far? Uh, for me, um, you know, obviously Bernie, um, just, you know, everything he did in 2016 um, and, and everything he's done since 2016 leading up to this election. So he's, you know, obviously a, a big candidate for us progressives as well. Um, learning about Tulsi was huge for me um, and everything she's fighting for. I think she's an amazing candidate. Um, just for her to bring to the forefront uh, the military industrial complex and endless wars, a new Cold War, all that type of stuff. That's so important for us to have a, a conversation for us to have um, mm -hmm. as a country. And I think for her to do that, even though she knew she was going to get a, have a media blackout, I mean, even more so than Bernie, because yeah, Bernie's, I mean, he talks about that stuff, but he's not coming after like Tulsi is. So, you know, if it's talking about war and endless war in the United States, you're going to have a media blackout on you. So that's, I, I, I applaud. Well, when you're not getting blacked out, you're going to get attacked. Right. Exactly. Or smeared. Yeah. Constantly. Like they did to her on The View and like they did to her all the time. Um, so for her to have that courage, uh, to, you know, make that the center point of her campaign, you know, I really applaud her for that. And I appreciate her for that. Um, and then Elizabeth Warren, I definitely have my problems with. Um, but I always tell my dad this, I said, for, if you think about it in, in the scope of, of where we are for her to be a lot of progressives, like third or fourth candidate, um, it's just so, it's crazy how far we've, we've moved this, um, just a conversation. The over 10 so, window, yeah. Right, yeah, over, the over 10 window, window exactly. left, yeah. For her to be, like, imagine, like, I think any progressive would have taken her over Hillary in 2016, right? But now she's our third or fourth choice. So just for that's that window to, to be moved that far left, that's why I really appreciate uh, people who have kind of steam, steam, uh, spearheaded that movement, like Bernie and like Tulsi. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I, have to, I have to put Gravel. Yeah, definitely yeah, that's Gravel. My that's my man. <laughs> Triple OG. Triple OG yeah. Gravel. Um, and it's interesting that you say that because uh, a lot of people um, don't really realize, in my opinion, just how far in the last three to four years um, that the Overton window has shifted left. It's shifted so far left that Bernie's even having trouble keeping up with it. Yeah. And that's saying something. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm not talking about in those vain ways that, you know, the neoliberals try to, all they want to do is talk about race, but never want to actually do anything about race relations right. um, or to better, you know, various peoples of color. And, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the real issues when we're talking about the military industrial complex for Tulsi to question the intelligence community. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a that's big huge. deal. Yeah. Um, that's what the left used to actually be known for doing rather mm -hmm. than capitulating to the intelligence community, we were known for challenging them in All the right. 60s and the 70s. Uh, right. for, for Bernie to, to make Medicare for all the most popular policy in the country around 70%, um, yep. even higher amongst just Democrats, mm -hmm. um, it, it really, and, and people aren't settling for life. And I saw Andrew's, Andrew Gilliam's campaign implode immediately the day after <laughs> he changed his website. The next day, he, changed the, yeah. he won the primary, the next day, website didn't say there for our anymore said for uh mm -hmm. in the affordable health care act yeah. lost the election it, it yeah. doesn't take much um mm -hmm. and so i i 100 agree the overton window has definitely shifted left for the better and i don't think it's going to change anytime soon because of the way social media is now um right. because yeah. the conversation i mean if you know about it um after 2016 Jim, uh people move on right, right. we just let right. obama handle business and we come back in four years and hey, you need us again all right, right. click exactly. you got this right okay i'm gonna go to the poll so exactly. Um, exactly. it was different this time. Right? People were still like, I mean, independent media, their mm -hmm. numbers went up. They grew, everybody grew exponentially. Everyone did, yeah. um, everybody, you know, became overall more educated. The people mm -hmm. who had 2,000, 2000 followers in 2016 and was still a good amount of people mm -hmm. end up with 50, 20, 30,000 by mm -hmm. the end, you know, in their own show, their own a blog, whatever, and that's that's pretty inspirational because it just it lets lets us know that um basically no we we haven't stopped paying attention and people are not going to stop paying attention right. uh, at least until we get these basic things taken care of. Right. Um. So and I, I want to switch gear. Go ahead. I was gonna say I was just I'm really I think I think the millennial generation is really spearheading this movement because 
of social media because we are so much more knowledgeable about politics now. Whereas, like you said, Andrew Gillum, you can't just switch that up and expect us not to notice. We know the difference between Medicare for all and access to affordable health care. Like we know the difference between that. And I think that's why it's so nice that you can go on social media and th- like we can have these videos uh, put up of people saying like switching, flip flopping all the stuff and then we can expose them. And then that goes viral. And that's really reaching millions and millions of people and that way we can especially as an electorate be more be more informed because i really think that's the biggest issue in america even to this day is with mainstream media and with people that only consume mainstream media is they're incredibly misinformed incredibly misinformed about the issues which is why you still have people supporting joe biden even though he's really not i don't even know if he's a moderate republican he's basically just a republican (laughs) he's Um, kind of worse not gonna lie, but you do enough research on him and you realize, he's like, bad, oh man, this guy is bad. He he's been bad like for a long time, too. He like, he I, he told countries straight up, if you raise your cancer prices, we will get you out of your out of whatever office you're in. Are you ready? Are they not raise the the price of your cancer? Drugs, mm. Get you what I the president, prime minister ever. Like he did it to, to uh, Brazil, he did it to Colombia, mm. and he did it to India. Um, force them to keep high cancer drug prices because big pharma pays off all the right. It's bad, especially because his son died of cancer. So right. he was doing all this using his nonprofit as if he was trying to help cure cancer and to help make it uh, make cancer care accessible. And he was on the opposite. Right. These people are like legitimately evil people. Like people die because of their policies. People die because of their votes on wars and and their involvement. And they just sit back and it's like they don't even care and. And I, like, personally, I don't, I don't know how they could live with themselves. I guess they have to fool themselves into thinking that what they're doing is right or just, but it's really 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 hard to believe, man. Well, they, they, you know, politicians now, I would say over the last hundred years, have been more obsessed with being a celebrity than, you know, doing what they were elected to do. So uh, real quick, I want to shift gears. So a lot of people don't know uh, how much politics is involved in sports, Um, you know, and, and, the NFL is a weird, a weird league, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because even though I think y'all still make have the highest revenue stream of all the sports in the country, um, in most of the sports overseas, except for soccer, maybe, and that's mm-hmm. with the entire world combined, um, y'all revenue share ain't looking quite right, man. <laughs> it ain't looking you. quite right. I'm telling you. But <laughs> have so so the collective bargaining agreement situation. A lot of people always make the argument, right? Why would I feel bad for somebody who makes? Five hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, two million dollars a season. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that, like doing doing what I do now, this is my full time job. I want to be able to right. be paid what I sh- deserve to be paid. Right, where you are, and yeah. I'm sh- and I'm sure you you and your colleagues feel the same way. Um, yeah. So, but when people when NFL players or other athletes, like the NBA, when they lock out, they talk about this stuff. People say, well, we well, shouldn't feel bad for them. Uh, my mm-hmm. argument has always been that's that is the work trying to take back seize the means of the production, which right. is quite literally production that you're producing. It's your body, yeah. right? It's and body. you put exactly. your body through the mirror to perform every night. Right. So what do you what what would you have to say to people who feel like um, you know, we should be apathetic towards the constant struggle, the push and pull between the players and owners, uh, when we easily sympathize with the person that, you know, the McDonald's worker down the street trying to get mm. paid 15 or $20 right. an hour and get paid what they're worth. Uh, but just because somebody makes more money, we're supposed to pretend like, cause that trickles down, right? That type of mind mm. where the owner thinks they can do whatever they want to y'all and y'all the ones putting your body right. out of line. That doesn't only stop at an NFL owner. You see CEOs that have the same mindset, which is why they treat yeah. people generally the same way. And you kind of see, I see a little parallel there between That's the cool. NFL and the, the general worker. They don't know how much the average NFL player makes like on a practice team third string yeah. you know they don't yeah they don't know those struggles so what would you have to say about that yeah i think that was a great point to bring up actually and and i, and I speak with you know people that i know more so about this a lot um when it comes to finance and stuff but you have to like you said it's a, it's a worker struggle right it's management versus the workers and and we are we as the nfl players we are the workers um and the owners and everything they're the management so It is, it's a relationship that you, it's tough, right? Because you have to have a working relationship with coaches and, you know, with the owners and everything to have have success in the field and and to be able to produce. But at the same time, when it comes to business, 
they're not going to really look out for you um, as a player, especially if you don't have guaranteed money or anything like that, because they can easily just replace you and there's not as many protections as there probably should be. So Man, yeah, think, you work in, you work in a, a right to work league, bro. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize that, especially for, I think people look at guys like Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes or these huge players and think that everyone in the league has those contracts and has those protections. They don't. A lot of people. Yeah, most 98% most, of yeah, them. Most people don't. Exactly. The NFL is one of the only leagues where there's, the contracts are not guaranteed. So yeah. I could have a four-year contract, but if they decide to cut me tomorrow, I don't get any of that money. I'm, I'm just on the street. Or so I think, people don't know, uh, like Justin's having a fantastic year. Plays eight games, is on the is setting a record. Mm -hmm. It's her, God forbid. If you don't play those last eight games, Justin don't get paid. It doesn't matter if he gets hurt. Right, exactly. People so, don't know that. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why it's so for us to be putting our bodies out there and, and to be you know risking that much, I think you have to add that into um, what we should be getting paid, right? So, I mean, when the, when the next collective bargaining is up, I think that's after next year. I think we're definitely mm -hmm. going to be trying to um, bargain for more of the share right now. I think we're only getting 47% of the revenue share. That's um, insane. That's ridiculous. Is, it really is crazy because we are we are the product. Obviously, the owners are they front the money and you know they they run everything. But people come to watch us play. So yeah, they're gonna fight. Do you think that you're gonna that. take a big role in trying to and try to guide that conversation for the younger players? Because like you're more representative of most of the players yeah. being because you're on a rookie contract and right. you know rookies getting you know whoo, well you'd be lucky to make it to two years as a rookie. So exactly. um. Uh, are you going to try to take a large part in that conversation? I'd love to. I've been uh, trying to get more involved with, you know, the union stuff. And obviously as a rookie last year, you don't really have too much of a say. But uh, <laughs> going to my second year and third year, uh, when those talks start to heat up, I, I definitely want to get more involved with it because I feel like I have a good pulse on um, what a lot of the guys feel. Um, and so that's something I want to get more involved in. But also just, you know, fighting for workers, which we are as well, like you were saying. We are yeah. – and and people like me, we are the working class of the NFL. Our rookies, you know, late yeah. round picks, undrafted guys. We are the working class of the NFL. So, you know, people people have to step up for us and, and be a voice for us. And but that's what's, that's what's uh, very important for guys that are um, making a lot of money. The bigger guys um, in the league, they have to. We have to have you know parity between us because they're obviously going to want to separate the working class and the people who are earning a lot more. Um, but yeah, they, they, they have to look out for us because we are the majority of yeah. you know, the players. So it's, it's important I, for us to have the support of the, the, the bigger guys. I well. got to say, I got a lot of respect for uh, LeBron James and Chris Paul and the other major superstars of the NBA back in, what, 2010, 2011? Was that, mm -hmm. was that the season? Whenever they yeah, did the yeah, lockout. 2011, I think. Um, yeah. They all took hits actually, temporarily and mm -hmm. play until December. Um but that collective bargaining agreement is probably one of the best collective bargaining agreement agreements in all of sports, it's right? Incredible. It's incredible. You got really bombs is. getting paid, man. I know y'all be sitting <laughs> outside saying. the club window with a salty face looking at them throw money in there like, I know. man, it ain't yeah, fair, bro. man. Bro. I just broke my collarbone today at practice, and I ain't going <laughs> to get paid tomorrow. I went to practice. I don't want to practice that week. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wild, man. NBA and MLB and all their contracts are guaranteed, like I said earlier. So it's it's a good it's a good. Then they, then they got the nerd uh, not to take a knee, boy. Pay me if you right. pay me ten million dollars a year, I might consider listening. But right, right. exactly, exactly, uh, exactly. So so um and so I want to make sure, like I said, for everybody who's watching, I want to make sure that we keep things in perspective. It's it's not necessarily the money that's important. It's understanding the struggle of the worker, um, mm -hmm. because y'all y'all hear five hundred thousand and you think that's guarantee. If I play one game, I'm not getting paid five hundred thousand. A lot of these right. NFL players, man, they exactly. live in apartments. They got yeah. one bedroom studio apartments. I know one of my friends had he was driving his Acura from college, um, yep. you know, because he didn't know what was going to happen. You really never, especially you know, with some of the 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 you know, the, just everybody's getting bigger, everybody's getting faster. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but they don't get workers comp in the NFL, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, if you're going to put high risk on your body, um, and invest that much time into something, you should absolutely be entitled to a high reward as well. Um, yeah, so sure. if, if it wasn't a consistent pattern that we've seen with the NFL, it's like every other league 
has decided to evolve with the times. Um, mm. And they've been benefiting greatly from it. Um, right. The players are happy. I mean, if you've been watching uh, this the last, what, three off seasons in the NBA, good God almighty. Uh, yeah. Everybody has been getting paid, man. <laughs> They, they made sure that the older players could get more money. They made mm -hmm. sure that the younger players could get more money, that you had an option to get performance incentives on your rookie deal, things mm -hmm. like that. And that's not crazy because in a regular job, if they're taking care of you, you should have health care for free. Right. You should you should get compensation if you're injured. You should be able to, you know, take time off. If uh, if you if as long as you follow the rules and you're doing what you're supposed to do and you know to the capacity that you have the power to do it. Mm -hmm. Then you should get paid because even there are people who show who bought tickets to a game, even though you may not be there, they bought those tickets three months ago. They right. bought them because you were on the they thought you were going to be on the field. And they already spent that money that they you know, for those tickets mm -hmm. team has. So um, so yeah, I, I wish you all luck. Uh, I Thank look you. forward to hearing about how it, how it goes how it goes over the next couple of years. But I mean, I've seen y'all making y'all campaign on Twitter. It's quite hilarious. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie, y'all been going hard. <laughs> yeah. hey, our, our union, our union, they they fight, they fight for us very hard, and um, I think all of us are really grateful towards them because um, it's important for all, all of us players to be together and have representatives um, that can go into those meetings and really fight for us. So unions are important, man. Even even in NFL and, and sports leagues. There you go, man. There you go. So um, do you have anything else that you'd like to let people know, like as far as Anything you have coming up or uh, anything that you would like to see from the people or we can or actually man i got some super chats man this uh okay, carlos cario he said uh this is very encouraging having a pro athlete not being corporate media keep lauren brillante said we uh we need to go all in this election and find ways to overcome the obstacles thrown at us it's time to wake mm -hmm. up the sleeping giant that is america um yeah, those are the only two super chats that we got for you. Um, but yeah, do you have anything else that you like to talk to the press about? Yeah, I just I think it's important for you know everybody to to speak up, you know, have their voice heard, and a lot of you know that whole conversation about oh you're just athletes or you're just this and that. No, I'm an American citizen as well. Everything that our government does affects me as well. Um, and I think when you have a platform, you should use it, um, like you're doing. Like I'm trying to do, you know, thank, that's why I appreciate you having me on your show is that I always want to speak up for the for the working man and, and the common man, um, you know, no matter where I'm at in my life. Um, so obviously, I would love to be more successful than I am now, and I'm going to keep striving for that. But I'll always, you know, be one who's on the side of, of the, the common person because that's where I came from. That's where, you know, a lot of my buddies that I even played college football with, they didn't end up making it to the NFL. They're working jobs, nine to fives. Um, and so I think we're all working hard in this country and I think our government should be doing more for us um, and, and really advocating for us and not for multinational corporations for, you know, just billionaires, just multimillionaires, just, um, you know, the 1% the basically or the top 10%. So um, I'll always be, you know, fighting for um, the common man, like I said, and, and I look forward to, to this next upcoming election. I'm going to do everything I can uh, to get you know, progressives in office. Good stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on as well, and I appreciate you appreciate using your you voice to advocate um, for the for the working class. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's very encouraging to see somebody like yourself um, starting at very young. Most people are scared to speak out and, you know, be mm -hmm. opinionated, but when your education is a help, and, and you seem to be yeah. more educated than most of the league on a lot of stuff, and you, you articulate your, your, your points very well, I'm sure the, the, the union and the league We'll be happy to have you advocating for them now and in, in the very near future. So I wish you luck this year, man. Go right. kill it. Uh, try yes, not sir. to get bounced this time, okay? Uh, <laughs> that, was uh, that was ridiculous. That was ridiculous. I know LA is sunny and make you a little lazy and get a little comfortable, but y'all got to get it together. Hey, that was, hey, bro. I know. I know. I know. I, my friends lost some money on y'all, man. Come on. Rough, man. Hey, I'm trying my best, <laughs> man. I'm trying my best, Nico. I promise I'm trying my best. There you go, bro. There you go. I can't wait to watch you, man. And for everybody else, uh, by the way, go follow Justin on Twitter. It's just it's just at Justin Jackson, right? It's uh J underscore man prime two one on Twitter. Twitter, J underscore man prime two one. That's what okay. happens when you have a famous college basketball player who also has your name. You don't even <laughs> exactly. have the rights to your own name. You should have been exactly. born earlier, Justin. A little bit earlier. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning into this live stream segment. That's it, Sukas, and always remember more than anything else. Find your balance. Peace.